Hey, good morning. Welcome to Brand New Church. Would you take a second to like, subscribe, and share? That allows us to share our message with the world around us. As for now, let's head right into the message. Today we're going to talk about the original house of pancakes. Not the restaurant, but the story. It takes place in a region called Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia was an ancient civilization, which is that modern-day Lebanon on the Mediterranean Sea. And at the time in history of this story, there was an extreme drought in that area. There had been no rain, and this was an agricultural society, agrarian society. So when there's no rain, there's no crops. Livestock die, there's no food. People die because they're starving to death and dying of thirst, etc., etc. We're going to enter the story where a prophet, an Old Testament prophet named Elijah. Say Elijah. Elijah, God has told him to go visit this village of Zarephath, which is right in the middle of, 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 of worship of Baalism, the god of Baal. Now, Baal was, was an ancient god worshipped in that area. It had been worshipped in Egypt. It was very popular to worship this god. And he was the god of provision. He was the god that would meet all your needs. He was the god that would come through for you. But this God with a lowercase g, because he really isn't a God, he's a false God, failed them. And these were a desperate people. Let me pick up the story in 1 Kings 17. And by the way, isn't it just like God to do a miracle when the circumstances don't look like it can happen? And I'm talking to some of you right now. The circumstances around you right now don't look like God's going to break through in this moment. But see, you don't receive a miracle until you need a miracle. We like receiving, we just don't like needing. But to receive a miracle or to experience a miracle, you got to need a miracle. Here we go. 1 Kings 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Remember, there's no water. So whatever water she has, it's the last of it, because it's not raining. Water sources are dried up. And as she was going, so she doesn't push back, she just goes to do it. She just obeys. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand, or bring me a, a pancake. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour and a jar and a little oil and a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Now listen, verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake, a little pancake of it, and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now watch that. I love this, man. The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and as she and her household, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, never ran out. Neither did the jug of oil become empty. According to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. See, we got a mama who's hopeless. She's out gathering sticks, which in that culture her son would have done that, but her son is so weak because he's starving that she has to go and gather sticks. She knows in a matter of days she's going to watch her baby die if she doesn't die first. Can you imagine how horrific that would be as a parent? To watch your baby starve to death. Circumstances, I, you can't make rain come. You can't make crops grow. There aren't manufacturing plants you can go and work. Everything comes out of the land. Hopeless. 
And God sends her an unexpected visitor named Elijah. And she's gathering sticks in her weak, frail body. And he said, hey, ma'am, could you go get me some water? What little water she had left, maybe a couple of glasses, she just goes and does it. Just obeys. Now, you have to understand in this story to get the, the meta-narrative of this. Elijah is a real person who really lived and walked the earth, but in Scripture, he's known as a Christophany. Say that with me, Christophany, which means he's an Old Testament picture, a type, a shadow, a resemblance of Jesus. Now, he's not Jesus. He was a man. But we see in Elijah things we will see in our Savior. So it's not just a prophet went to a single mama's house. It's a picture of Jesus with us. You follow me? That's the greater picture of the Scripture. So he says, now when you go to get the water, would you make me a pancake first? He goes, so I'm not trying to be rude, but I just got a little bit of flour in, in a flower pot and a little bit of oil in the, in the oil jug, and, and I got enough to make one pancake for me and my boy. We're hungry. I'm gonna, I've been stretching this out for weeks and months to have just a little bit every day to eat a little bit just to sustain us, and I got enough for one pancake, and I'm going to split it in half, give half to my son and half to me, and then we're going to starve to death and die. He said, I get it. I get it. Don't be afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be afraid. And just saying don't be afraid wouldn't help me. That might even make me mad. He said, don't, do not fear. Go make the pancake. But make me one first. She does it. And the miracle happens. So we got a mama who was hopeless. Just like there's people in this room today, you're hopeless. Or you got friends or family that are hopeless. Circumstances around you are not conducive for what you want to see happen. But because you can't see it, doesn't mean that God doesn't see it. And because you can't figure it out in your mind how the pieces are going to come together, doesn't mean that God doesn't know how the pieces are going to come together. She was a mama who was hopeless. Number two, we find a mama who was tested. Go make it. Go make the pancake, but make one for me first. In this story, as throughout Scripture, story after story, from Genesis to Revelation, we see in Scripture the principle of the first. And here's what it is. The first goes to God. The first in your day goes to God. The first place in your marriage goes to God. The first place as a parent goes to God. The first place uh, at your job goes to God. And the first place in your finances goes to God. See, every time you and I get paid, it's a test. A test? Yeah. Who am I going to say thank you to for the income that I've received? Am I going to thank the mortgage company? I'm going to thank Kroger or Walmart. Sorry, not Kroger, Walmart. Am I going to, am I going to thank, you know, the gasoline station, Netflix, Prime, Hulu? Who am I going to thank for what God gave me? Here's what Jesus said. Here's what God said. Jesus said it too. When you get paid, it's a test. And I want, here's how you return the first. If you make $1,000 on your paycheck, you return the first $100 to me, first 10%. You, and you do it to me through the church. Not through something you want to do. Not through a, a, a nonprofit. Not through a college. Not through a school. You do it through your church. And I will do more through the 900 that's left than you could ever do through the 1,000. You say, Brad, you don't understand. I don't need $1,000 to make it. I need $1,500 to make it. And the $500 is on a credit card. On paper, we can't. I'd like to do it. I'd like to be one of those people that can do it. But I can't do it. Exactly. 
just like her. If you could do it, it wouldn't take faith. You got to do it when you can't see it. You got to do it when it doesn't come together. That's what it means to trust God. You see, we're talking about heart for the house. And by the way, my favorite topic to preach on is money. A lot of preachers always talk about money. I love talking about money because nothing brings life change in people's lives like when God gets their money right. It's the, it's the lid to breakthrough in your life. You can know Him as your Savior. You can be baptized, come to brand new church every week and miss it if God's never first in your finances. Not miss heaven. You miss what real freedom is. Because there's not enough money to make you happy. You're living in a home better than you thought you would 20 years ago, driving better cars, take better trips, and you're still not any happier than you were 20 years ago. Because stuff don't make you happy. I met with a guy the other day. He's got more cars. He's probably got $3 million in cars. He's got a Lamborghini SUV, a Lamborghini sports car, two Rolls Royce SUVs, Cullinan's. He's got a Bentley SUV. It's very unique, a Bentley car. He's got this Mac uh, tricked-out truck. And I sat across the table from him at a, at a country club, and I said, you know, money doesn't make you happy. He goes, Brad, don't make you happy. You can't, you can't buy enough cars to be happy. He lives in a 15,000-square-foot home on the, ninth, on the 18th hole. He said, don't make you happy. See, freedom doesn't come in the mount. Freedom comes in obedience. You follow me? It's a test. So she's tested. What am I going to do? I, just, I don't have three pancakes worth of flour, three pancakes worth of oil. I got enough for one. So once I make this pancake, the barrel's empty. The oil jar is empty. I'm going to feed you, preacher man, and I'm going to die with my son. She makes the pancake. He's eating it. Can you imagine the look that she's giving him while she's eating her and her son? Look what it says in Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes, that's the 10%, into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great. Say so great. You won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the what, 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 what? Test. The only place in Scripture he says to test me. Let me tell you what the blessings of God are. It doesn't mean you're going to be rich. doesn't mean you won't get cancer. doesn't mean you won't lose a job. doesn't mean you won't lose a house. Here's what it does mean. God puts his hand upon you. And he meets your every need. Unusual things happen. Things last longer than they should. You find somebody to fix the car that does it for half the price. God connects you, crosses your path with people that opens other door, doors for you that you could have never humanly orchestrated. God brings the right people at the right time in your life. God puts his hand upon your children. God's blessing is upon your life. And you prosper. He says, put me to the test. You can never outgrow tithing. And for many of you, when it comes to the heart for the house, you're saying, what should we do? If you're not tithing, start there. Start there. Just say, what we're going to give in the heart for the house is we're going to begin tithing. That's what we're going to do. Now, if you're already one of those that does that, which proud of you for that, that's great. I want to challenge you to give over and above that. As a one-time offering, over and above your tithe, to give the largest amount you've ever given to the Lord or to anything. Some of you, that would be a $5,000 gift. Some of you might be a hundred thousand. Some of you might be a $10 million gift. Who knows? Whatever it is, I want to challenge you to do that. You say, Brad, church is just about money. We're not about money. Let me help you. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need Elon, Elon Musk's money. Jeff Bezos, he don't need your money. God's filthy rich. Let me tell you another one. Brand new church doesn't need your money. 
This isn't about brand new church needs your money. God was taking care of brand new church before I arrive, before you arrive. He'll take care of it long after we're gone. So breathe. What I'm sharing with you is not to get something from you. It's to do something for you. Say it again. God's taking great care of brand new Look around, man. You're not hurting. God's taking care of this church. You got campuses all over the place. God's blessed you. God wants to know that I have your heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where you put your money, your heart will follow. You don't care about Walmart stock until you buy Walmart stock. When you buy Walmart stock, you can't stop looking at Walmart stock. Why? Because you invested in it. When you pay for your kids to go to a private school, you drove past that school for years, never cared to look about that school. Once you start paying money for that school, you're investing in that school. You wonder what's happening in that school. Who's the principal of that school? How many, how many kids per teacher in that school? What programs in the school? Why? Because your money's invested in the school. She was a mama who was tested number three. She was a mama who experienced a miracle. Now think about this with me. There was no natural way this situation could be solved. Okay? She couldn't plant more crops. There wasn't any grain to be ground into flour. There wasn't like she didn't have money to go buy flour. There is no flour. It's not like she couldn't Buy more oil. There is no, there's no olives on the trees. It's olive oil. There's no olive, olives being pressed. There's no oil being produced. There is nothing. There's no way in the natural and what you can see, touch, smell, and hear that could meet the need of this single mama and her boy. Couldn't be done. The only way that their need physically could be met is through a supernatural provision. So, she, so he's eating that pancake, and he says, go make you one. She's like, you're funny. Go make you one. She goes over, and there's just enough flour and oil to make one pancake for her son. She makes it, boom. He goes, make you one too. She goes back, there's just enough. God put flour in the barrel from heaven. God put oil in the jar from heaven. God brought it from where they never saw it coming. And the Bible says, oh, by the way, this drought lasted a long time even after this story took place. And the Bible says, all the days of her life and the life of her boy, that every time she went to the barrel, there was enough to make a cake. Every time she went to the oil jug, there was enough. There was enough water coming in. There was enough for them to live and survive and thrive for many days, the Bible says. See, what you have to understand about God is God created the economy. God was blessing people before America was ever even an idea. Before Dow Jones existed. Before NASDAQ existed. Before anything we know in America existed, God's been meeting the needs of people. He's not limited by what you see. He's not limited by what you can earn. He's not limited by where you live. He's not limited by where your life is. He's not limited. I remember our, our church was young in Tampa. We had planted this church. We were there for almost 22 years, but this was early in, first couple of years. We had moved from meeting in an apartment complex clubhouse to an elementary school. We went from paying $400 a month to paying $3,000 a month. It might have been $30 million a month because I couldn't afford it. We had about 30 people, 50 people, counting every dog, cat, parakeet, everything. And we couldn't pay that rent. But I had no other options of a place to meet. There was no other place. So I said, man, God's going to supply. Well, he wasn't supplying Got one month behind, two months behind, three months behind. We'd have been kicked out had it not been for the principal being a godly lady. She gave us grace. I was putting everything I could to make the church go, so I, I, we didn't have anything. So we got behind on our mortgage a couple months. 
And I, our little, Caroline and her, her twin sister, Catherine, were infants. Landon, our oldest son, he was just three years old. So Steph would get them to bed, and she'd go to bed, and I'd go walk the neighborhood during the night praying for God to do a miracle. I was so stressed out. Couldn't, I mean, just, I was eating chocolate chip cookies. I could eat 12 cookies and not even take a breath. I'm sorry, I mean, I'd go to Krispy Kreme Donuts, that hot light would be on. You ever, you ever, listen. I, went to, I went to Krispy Kreme Donuts so many times. The one time we're driving down, the light's on, and Seth goes, the light's on, and my son Landon began to sing the Hallelujah Chorus because he knew Daddy loves Krispy Kreme. I, could, I would go in there. I, I was eating like a man going to the electric chair. I was eating so much. I was so stressed. Everybody know what I'm talking about. Come on, help me out here. I was so stressed out. One day, Steph took the kids to Walmart. I was at home by myself studying at our little dining room table. So stressed out. Didn't know how God was going to do it. And I sensed the presence of God come in that dining room. While I was praying. And I sensed he was saying to this in my heart. It wasn't audible. It was an impression on my heart. You preach me, and you love people. You obey me, and I'll pay every bill. That afternoon, I got a phone call. A lady named Nicole. She goes, hey, Pastor Brad, this is Nicole Arche. I said, how are you? She goes, John and I were just thinking. I, mean, I haven't mentioned this, right? Like, nobody knows. I mean, I'm, I'm holding all this in. She goes, I don't know how. We, we pay rent for the school, right? Yeah, she goes, this may already be taken care of, but. We wonder if we could just pay a month's rent for the school because we love our church. Would that be a problem? Would you be offended if we paid a month's rent for the school? I'm like, no, 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 I won't be offended at all. <laughs> True story. Another day, maybe two days later, I get a phone call from their neighbor. Her name was Tanya. Her and her husband, Roger, had recently given their lives to Jesus. I had baptized them. Baby Christians. She goes, hey, Pastor Brad, um, this is probably already taken care of, but me and Roger were just talking. We just got this settlement, this insurance settlement, um, from a car accident, it's a pretty good amount of money, and, and we'd like to pay a month's rent on the school. Would that be a problem? No, ma'am, that's not a problem. Too much rent. Another day later, I'm driving down Bruce B. Downs Boulevard. I'm going under I-75. I, I could take you right to the spot where my phone rang in my car. There's a pastor from Atlanta. His name was Johnny. I said, hey, Pastor Johnny. He goes, Brad, what do you need? I said, I didn't know what, he goes, Brad, I was praying this morning, and I just felt a strong impression from the Lord to call you. What do you need? I said, I need you to pay two months rent on the school. How much is it? I said, $3,000 a month. He goes, I'm sending you a $6,000 check today. Now, four or five days earlier, I had no hope. If we had the best offers we ever had, we still couldn't pay the rent. But what God said he would do, he did. And in less than a week, we called up and had one month extra paid in advance. That's a good God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just one story. I could tell you story after story after story after story. Personally, in our home, in our church, in our life. I could tell you story after story of people I've pastored all through the years that learned to trust God with the first. And they saw God's activity in their life increase and they, their faith was built and they learned that what he says he will do, he will do. Yeah, that's good. Number four. She was a mama that was hopeless. She was a mama that was tested. She was a mama who received the miracle. Can you imagine what she told her grandkids? You're not going to believe this. But there was no grain growing in the field, but we had flour in the barrel. There were no olives on the olive trees, but we had oil in the jug. Tell us, Mama, tell us what happened. Every time I went back in there, we made it. Me and your daddy, we lived day after day, week after week, month after month, because God met our need. Some of you, you say those very things to your children and grandchildren. You've served and you've trusted a faithful God. You've seen good. Some of you have been here at Brand New Church from its infancy. You remember when you could put everybody in, a, in the back of a Volkswagen. And now you come in here. You've been here, you've been here 15, 20 years. 
And you sit in a room full of people like this. You're walking through that new building about to be built. And you can say, baby, it's been the greatest investment of our life. We've seen the faithful hand of God. Last. She was a mama who touched the future. Very quickly after this miracle began to transpire, her son dies. Tragically, out of nowhere. She's devastated. You know, there was no way for a woman to make income except prostitution. She didn't want to do that. So her whole security and future was in her son. Her son would be responsible for taking care of her. Now that was gone. First it was the flower and the oil and the water. Now it's her boy. God, what are you doing? I obeyed you. What are you doing? Sure enough, Elijah goes upstairs. Now, what I'm, I'm going to read to you is a little odd for us in our culture. But you've got to understand, this is, this is a long time ago. He goes up there in that room. This little boy's laid on the bed with his arms stretched out, his legs stretched out, dead. And Elijah gets on top of him, his chest against his chest, his legs on top of his legs, his arms on top of his arms, and his face on top of his face. Let's read about it. Verse number 21, and he stretched himself out over the child three times. He did it once. Live again. He breathed on him. He did it another time. Live. Look what he says. Look what he says. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The first time, God, please do it. Second time, God, please do it. The third time he gets on him, he prays it. Look what happens. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. When you obey God, you don't know what the future holds. But I can promise you this. He stretches himself out over the future, over your life, and he brings life into things that were otherwise dead. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of heart for the house. Because it's not just what God does for you. It's what God does in the lives of people. Now, you understand that this new building, is heart for the house is not about a building. This building is a shoe. You just outgrown it. It's like a pair of Jordans. You just outgrown it. That's a larger pair of Jordans. And you'll outgrow it one day in Jesus' name. Yeah. But you're, the building is not the deal. The building is a pair of Jordans. Heart for the house is about the people who aren't here yet. Yeah. Yeah. See, some of you are here that weren't here when they moved in this building. But when they moved in this building, you heard about it, you came, and Jesus changed. How many of you, Jesus changed your life in this building? Raise your hand. Look at this, look at this, look at this. That's heart for the house. Yeah. See, up and down these streets, right now, are people who are dead in their soul. They're in, a, they're in a, a whirlwind of despair and darkness. And when we obey God, God stretches out over what we have done and what we've committed, and God brings life to people that are dead. He does it. I remember not long after God met that need that I told you about. I was standing in front after the service on a Sunday outside the facility. And a lady came up to me, and I, I knew her because her sister had come, cut my hair. Her sister did, and she came and gave her life to Christ. And then she came and gave her life to Christ. And they asked me to pray for their, their third sister, Joanne. So she came out. She goes, Brad, you know my sister Joanne we prayed for? She goes, her husband, you know the one that hates your guts? I was like, and, you know, as a pastor, I've always struggled with that, Jeremy. Like, I look at the mirror in the mirror, and I think, how could anybody ever hate this face? I don't get it. But trust me, they have. He goes, he hates your guts. You know, he's he's an atheist and angry, and he cusses about you. I never even met him. 
She says, well, he had surgery for lung cancer to remove a mass out of his lung, and he got an embolism in his lung, and, he, and he's, he's dead. He's, well, he's, he's, he's brain dead. He's on the ventilator at St. Joe's Hospital. Would you pray for him? I said, better yet, I'll go there. So that Sunday afternoon after church was over, I went, went to the ICU, and the doctor was talking to Joanne about there was really nothing else they could do. I got down by his left ear, and I said, Daryl, they say the last thing to go is your hearing. If you can hear me right now, if you'll call on the name of Jesus right here in this ICU hospital bed and ask him to be your Savior and to change your life, he'll save you right here, right now. How many believe that Jesus can do that? So I prayed for him, prayed for Joanne, and I'm leaving, walking down those floors just squeaking. Those hospital floors, they always squeak. I said, God, please don't let him die until he hears a full presentation of the gospel. So several weeks pass. I go home on a Wednesday afternoon. This is how long ago it was. We had an answering machine. The lights, those of you back in the dark ages, we had these things called answering machines that had blinking lights on them. So I pushed the button on the answering machine, and a voice came on and said, Hey, Brad, this is Daryl Johnson. I'm alive. I want to talk about God. Call me. So, man, I got the phone. I called him, set up an appointment for Saturday. I had this old beat-up Cherokee, red Jeep Cherokee back then. I pulled into this gated, beautiful neighborhood, driving down this beautiful street, all these perfect light poles. And I pull in this, you know, this stone-cut driveway leaking oil all over it. <laughs> I go in there, and they escort me into their, their sitting area. And I'm sitting on furniture that was more, worth more than my house. And I said, Daryl, what's going on? He said, Brad, I... I died and saw hell, and I'm terrified. I don't want to talk about Jesus. So I gave him the gospel, and I knelt down. Joanne, his wife, was kneeling on my left side, Daryl on my right side. We knelt in front of that couch, that $10,000 couch, and I led them in a prayer to give Jesus their life. They're slinging snot all over that couch, and so was I, as they prayed and gave their hearts to Jesus. Now, I've been at this a long time, over three decades. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone that was such a 180 overnight as Daryl Johnson. Transformed. I mean, transformed. Never missed church. He brought his buddies every week, his rich friends. His, he would meet me out in the lobby saying, Brad, this is, this is Nick Anderson. He's got more money than he can spend in 10 lifetimes. Isn't that right, Nick? He's like... And he's going to hell just like I was. I want you to tell him how you can know Jesus. He would do that. He would do it week after week. So, anyway, the cancer came back with a vengeance, and Daryl passed away. I remember his, his wife called me. She goes, Brad, do you want to come see him before, before, the, uh, before the funeral home gets here? So I went. He was on that hospice bed, you know. And around his bed were all these people that he'd been working on to get him, try to get him to church. There was one of his Buddhist friends. And, there was one of Joanne's friends. She was like into some kind of new age mysticism. She's dangling crystals over his body. And I'm thinking to myself, when I go, I want people like that around my bed that I'm loving trying to reach. Yeah. 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 So she goes, Brad, can I tell you how he died? She goes, he was just a little bit ago. She was breathing, struggling to breathe. And he kept lifting his hand up. He was weak, but he was trying to lift it up. And we kept asking him if he was seeing family members. He didn't see any of them. And finally, I said, Daryl, is it Jesus? He said, he got the biggest smile on his face. And he pointed, and he was gone. I preached his funeral. Years passed, almost a decade. Steph and I bought a new home. I'm walking my dog down the street the first week we lived there, Labrador Retriever. This lady comes at the end of her driveway with two miniature Doberman Pinschers. She goes, sir, can I stop you? I said, yeah. She goes, I know you. That always makes me nervous. <laughs> she goes, I said, how do you know me? She goes, you remember a guy by the name of Daryl Johnson? I stopped for a moment. I thought, yeah, I haven't heard that name in almost 10 years. She goes, thank you for loving Daryl. Thank you for sharing Jesus with she goes, my husband worked with Daryl. They used to party together. My husband was an atheist. And she said, 
when Daryl gave his life to Jesus, he goes, I've been a Christ follower and been in church, taking my kids to church. My husband never comes. Just pray for him. She goes, when, when Daryl gave his life to Christ, it was such a transformation. My husband couldn't understand it. She goes, I want you to know that when you preached his funeral, my husband gave his life to Jesus. And our family's been changed. And she goes, we go to a church, we go to a church on the other side of town, and my husband's a leader in that church. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving Daryl John. See what happened is, we obeyed God. And God stretched him out his life out over Daryl and over this family. For many days, the barrel of flour was never empty. And the jug of oil never ran out of supply. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for this dynamic church. Thank you for Shannon and Cindy and their family. Thank you for them. Lord, I pray over this heart for the house offering that, God, you'd miraculously meet the need. Bless it, Lord. For all the thousands upon thousands of lives in northwest Arkansas that don't know you today, Jesus, that are going to know you in that new building, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you say, Brad, I need what Daryl got. I want Jesus to change me, to save me. My life is broken. My life is empty. And I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, would you just pray with me privately in your heart? Just say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I can never save myself. And I believe that you died on a cross for me and rose again for me. And today I'm turning from the direction of my life and I'm turning to you, Jesus. Save me. Wash me clean. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.